Well, it's good to see everyone here this evening. It's always good for us to take a break in the middle of the week and to uh, think about spiritual things together, to study from the Word of God and kind of uh, recharge our batteries. And so we'll look this evening uh, at Revelation chapter 19. If you're visiting with us, we are thankful for your presence, and uh, we want you to be with us any time that you can be with us. So please come again if you can. Revelation 19, uh, by this point in the book, if you've been with us uh, throughout our study or for the last several weeks, you should be getting a sense of what is about to happen by now because the pattern is very familiar. Uh, the book started off after the great throne scene of God with a series of judgments. And those were partial judgments, but they eventually became full judgments. And we would see a picture of uh, judgment followed by praise, or sometimes the praise comes first and then you hear about the judgment. But it has been that picture played over and over again, different images, different expressions, different themes. And you may have noticed also that as we go through the book that the more John goes through this cycle, the longer the cycle gets. And so chapters uh, 17, 18, and 19 you could argue, really go together. Uh, chapter 17, we saw the, uh, the picture of the, the great harlot that sits on the many waters. And then in chapter 18, we heard about the coming destruction of this great empire. And it's not until chapter 19, however, that we hear the eruption of praise for all of this. And so this is yet another presentation of this picture. And we're headed up obviously, to kind of a big bang finale in chapters 20, 21, and 22. Uh, we've heard a lot about victory in the book, and we're going to hear about that again this evening, but we haven't seen the real victory yet, and that's how the book ends in chapters 21 and 22 with the scene of glory in heaven. Uh, there is a sense in which it is kind of the complement to what we saw at the beginning of the book in chapters 4 and 5. The book started with a vision of God in heaven. The book will end with a vision of heaven, but this time not just God, but his people with him there as well. So the story has moved from God in heaven and his people on earth, ultimately to his people joining him in heaven in the end. And so that's kind of a a big picture kind of sketch of what it is that we're looking at to help us kind of see uh, in proper perspective what it is that we're looking at tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to look at chapter 19 starting in verse 1. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. Uh, he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his righteous saints, uh, of his uh, righteous ones on her. We have here this great outpouring of praise. The Old Testament term for that would be a hallel. Uh, if you know anything about uh, the Old Testament language, hallel is actually a verb in the Hebrew language. It means he praises a halal would be he praises, halal is praise, and there are many psalms in the Old Testament that are known as praise psalms, or sometimes called halal psalms. Uh, John is particularly drawing on a particular grouping of those, uh, and the ones 104, 105, and 106 seem to be the model of what John is looking at here, maybe more than anything else. Uh, those particular psalms, uh, and this text as well, have the theme of praise to God for his righteous judgment that avenges his servants. You may recall that that is a very common theme, especially in the psalms, that a psalmist may have been in trouble, and yet he, God has delivered him from his enemies, and so he pours out his praise for what God has done for him. Uh, but the Psalms are not the only place where we find this. We find this in the so-called Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for the, uh, this, his land and his people. So this idea of God fighting for his people 
is really quite common throughout the Old Testament. And you'll notice what we get here as well. Uh, it starts off in verse 1, hallelujah, which is a Hebrew term that means praise God. And then you'll notice in verse 3, a second time they said, hallelujah, uh, his smoke uh, goes up forever and ever. So it begins and it ends with this hallelujah. And this is how many of the Psalms in the Old Testament work. Psalm 106, 113, 115 begins and ends with that kind of refrain calling on uh, the assembly to praise God and so it kind of bookends or brackets uh, the, uh, the praise in that kind of way, beginning and ending in the same way. Uh, so what we're looking at here is kind of an imitation of a psalm. And of course, people in the first century, and especially somebody like John, who was more familiar with the Old Testament than you and I are, would have felt very at home in this kind of language. And... In typical fashion, we get some reasons for praising God uh, in the psalm here. Uh, his judgments are true and righteous. He has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the blood of his uh, righteousness, uh, of his righteous servants on her. And so as the passage we just noted, uh, John is echoing there from Deuteronomy 32, his judgments are true. Now, Remember back from the earlier part of the book, and we saw this as late as chapter 13 as well, that what John and what the Lord wants for these Christians is faithfulness. The way you're going to overcome this enemy is by not giving in. Because even if they put you to death and you have not bowed down to their demands, you become the winner and they become the loser. And we saw in chapter 13 that John said, that there's no use in trying to fight this by the sword. He that takes up the sword will die by the sword, and we heard that very early on in the book as well. No, what you need to do is endure and be faithful, and God will take care of this enemy. So that's kind of where we're coming at here, that the praise is now that God has kept his promise. His judgments are true. He has kept his word. He has destroyed the enemy of God's people. Uh, specifically, he has judged the great harlot and avenged the blood of the servants of God that she has taken. Uh, we saw that description back in chapter 17 uh, and uh, as far back as chapter 12 as well, the death of the two witnesses in the great city, uh, their blood being shed there. Uh, of course, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to think that Jezebel, is kind of the background of this. So in 2 Kings 9 and verse 7, uh, you shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants and prophets and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. Uh, remember, Jezebel was married to King Ahab. That was a time when Idolatry was rampant in Israel. Jezebel tried to wipe out the worship of God and to establish the worship of Baal. And Elijah says that she had killed many prophets with the sword. She had threatened Elijah himself. And so God, in his great catastrophic judgment on the house of Amri, says, I'm going to wipe them out. And here comes the word in 2 Kings 9 that I'm going to avenge all the wrong that she has done against my servants. Well, that becomes a model for what God would do in the Messianic age, that there would be another great contest and conflict involving idolatry, but the stakes would be perhaps even higher. And God, like he did then, would avenge his people and destroy their enemy, even though this enemy is much greater. And so God is proving himself uh, to be the God of all. Uh, in verse 3, uh, the second time they say, Hallelujah, his smoke rises up forever and ever. Uh, this again is judgment language from the Old Testament. It is drawn from Isaiah 34 and verse 10 as God says uh, what he is going to do to the Edomites. Uh, speaking of their destruction and the, uh, the fire that he will kindle, it will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will go up forever. 
From generation to generation it will be desolate. None will pass through it forever and ever. You really get the sense that God is trying to say, no, never again. Not another nation like this. Not another enemy like this. God is going to deal with them in a decisive way, and they will not recover. Uh, and then in verse 4, uh, after we hear this great praise, now remember that it was something like the voice of a great multitude. And we're going to hear that again in verse 6, so just kind of hold on to that. But we get uh, kind of a, a picture now of who it is that is pouring out all of this praise. John says in verse 4, the 24 elders... And the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And so they are joining in the praise now. And the picture is that God's people who have been rescued from their enemy now swell in this great shouting chorus of praise and that every living being in heaven joins in with them the heavenly beings that are around the throne, the 24 elders, the living creatures, and uh, we're going to see later on ultimately that all the angels uh, join in this as well. And so it kind of takes us back to the throne scene that started the book in chapters 4 and 5. And remember, the purpose of that throne scene was to impress us with the power of God. The message was that don't think for a minute that things are out of control that because God's people are suffering, that God can't do something about it. No, the fact is that God is firmly in control. He is sitting on his throne in heaven. He knows what's going on, and he's about to act. Well, this is about the third time now that John has taken us back uh, kind of to that throne scene to remind us that you, you can count on God. Just like he said, God's judgments are true, he has done what he promised, and he is uh, therefore proven to still be in control. Well, verse 5, uh, a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Uh, John is continuing here his... Uh, imitation of Old Testament praise literature. Uh, we saw that in the first four verses. And here in verses 5 through 8, we have uh, the typical elements of a hymn. Uh, some of you already know or maybe remember from previous studies that you've done uh, that very often these hymns in the Old Testament follow a very predictable pattern. They have pretty much stock pieces to them. One of them is a call on everybody to join in with praise. And so we see that here in verse 5. We have a voice saying, give praise to our God, and they uh, rouse it again in verse 6, hallelujah. Then also, uh, in these Old Testament hymns, there is very often then following that the reason why we are to join in with this praise. And so here we get that kind of thing in verse 6. The Lord God, uh, our God, the Almighty reigns. Uh, that's the kind of language that might just escape us very easily, but I want you to look for just a moment at what John is really saying there. Uh, the Lord, our God. Uh, you might have caught on by now that that's the language that was used to address the Roman emperor. And John is saying, no, the emperor is not our Lord and God. The God of heaven is our Lord and God. Let's get that straight right now. And written to Christians who were being pressured to call Caesar Lord and God. Remember, we've noted before that Domitian 
reputedly insisted on being called Lord God Domitian. Well, written to these Christians in that time, that's code language almost, that we're not going to bow down to Domitian or any other Roman emperor. The only one that we call Lord and God is the one who is in heaven. You'll notice that he is also called the Almighty. Uh, that is, again, a term that was used of the Roman emperors. The, um, they were sometimes called the Self-Mighty, but sometimes the Almighty as well. But remember that Almighty is a term from the Old Testament that is sometimes translated Lord of hosts, God in his military strength. The picture of God with an army that can crush any army or any opposing force in the world. And so what is it that we are being called upon to praise God for? That he is who he says he is. That he truly is the Lord and the God, the true God. That he has, with his great might, defeated the enemy. And there is no question about who reigns over this earth. Of course, the Roman emperors prided themselves in reigning over the entire inhabited earth of their day as far as they knew about it and John is saying no all of those terms that the Roman emperors claimed those only belong to our God he's the one that really reigns and then very often in these uh, hymns there will be a detailed report of just exactly what God has accomplished that makes this praise so worthy and so we get that here in verses 7 and 8 what is it that has happened? Uh, and what is it that uh, in particular calls on us to recognize the reign of God? Well, the image shifts a little bit, maybe to our surprise. Uh, we start hearing about a marriage. The marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready, and she's adorned like a beautiful bride in uh, linen, uh, white or bright and clean, suggesting her purity. And so, at first we think, well, I was expecting to hear about a victory, but I hear about a wedding. But remember what we said, that the victory that is being encouraged for the early Christians is faithfulness. That if you maintain your purity, and you don't give in to the emperor cult and, and bow down and call this man Lord or God, then you are one of the victors. And so this image of a bride in her purity really does go with the imagery of conquest and victory after all, because that is the very thing that wins them the victory. And uh, just about like everything else in the book, John is relying heavily upon an Old Testament text here, Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10. Now, you may remember that Isaiah 61 is looking far into the future from Isaiah's day, looking into that time when the Israelites have come back already from Babylonian captivity, which is ultimately a picture of the Messianic age, as God's people come back to him out of the captivity of sin. And so what did God say would be going on in that day? Here's what they would say, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord, my soul will exult in my God, he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped in me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And the underlined words that you see there are all words that appear here in Revelation 19, 5 through 8. So John has taken this text that talks about rejoicing and righteousness and the bridal imagery, and he is saying, as it were, here is the great fulfillment of that text. Uh, he's not quoting it word for word, but by now I think we're used to the fact that John doesn't need to quote things word for word. He calls up a picture from the Old Testament and shows us its fulfillment uh, in the lives of these early Christians. Uh, and the ancient Jews believed that the speaker in Isaiah 61 was Jerusalem. Jerusalem personified, or perhaps we would say the people of Jerusalem in the Messianic age, shouting out their praises to God for what God has done and uh, identifying themselves as God's bride. Now, Leland asked a moment ago if something we saw in the text was the same as something else later on. 
you get that same kind of thing going on here. Uh, we're going to see in chapters 21 and 22 the bride imagery again. The new Jerusalem is going to be described like a bride. Uh, and so John is kind of whetting our appetite for that. Uh, that will be revealed more in a little bit. Um, we might not be so very familiar with ancient wedding uh, ceremonies. They're really not like what we do in Western culture. And so maybe to understand a little bit better, we might want to take a little bit of a tour through an ancient wedding. Uh, the groom would be dressed in the very finest clothing that could be found for him, dressed up in kingly type garb. That is in a, in a Jewish wedding. And that was, I think, mostly influenced by a lot of the language in the Old Testament in which God is described as the bridegroom. And so uh, in imitation of God's love for Israel, the bridegroom would be dressed kind of like a king. Of course, the bride would be adorned with the very best that the family had, the very best uh, clothing that they could find, all the family jewels. She would be wearing them that day as well as necklaces with family coins and things like that on them, uh, just showing how richly adorned and, uh, and uh, lavished with wealth she was. Now, that wasn't necessarily pretentious. Uh, it was a symbol of blessing. It was to say, this is the woman who is being blessed, and, and all of her adornment and her jewelry was a symbolic expression of blessing. Uh, on the wedding day, the groom would go to get the bride personally to escort her back to his home. And so if you lived in a village in ancient times, there would be a procession. The groom and his friends would leave his house and go down to the bride's house, fetch her, and then go back. Uh, Jesus alludes to this, for example, in Matthew 25, the parable of the virgins. They're waiting for the bridegroom to come back with the bride and, they, and half of them run out of oil. That's the, the background there. Uh, once he got her, there would be a processional to the groom's home, kind of like a little parade. And it was the kind of thing that would call you out of the house and you would stand in the street and cheer and clap as they went by because this was the biggest day in their life in ancient times. Uh, they would finally arrive at the groom's house, and the wedding would then take place. And after the uh, wedding, there would be a feast. And in the very best weddings, guests were required to wear wedding garments. You remember there's a parable of Jesus about that, a man who comes to a feast without his garments, and he is told that he can't stay. Uh, of course, if, you know, depending on how how much money was available that would be provided to everybody. And this wedding feast didn't just last an afternoon, it lasted for days. Uh, and we might think, wow, how could you do that for days? But remember, this is not a world in which you can get into a car and drive 100 miles or get on an airplane and fly 1,000 miles to go to a wedding and then turn around and go home. People would have traveled for days to get there. They're not going to eat a piece of cake and then go home that night. Uh, they're going to stay for a while, and uh, you have the celebration going on as long as they're there. Uh, this was done, of course, not only in Jewish culture, but in other cultures as well. This is a Greek urn uh, in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and you can see here that the bridegroom is getting up into the chariot. He has put his bride in the chariot uh, there, and they are now about to go off. He has grabbed the reins, and they're about to head off. The fellow here is one of the bridegroom's attendants, and he is holding a torch, so he's going to walk with them uh, and light the way because these processions usually were done uh, after dark. And so uh, there's kind of a scene from antiquity to, to kind of put with the picture here. And so we read here about... Uh, the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. The bridegroom is on his way. The bridegroom is waiting for him to show up. And they will then join themselves together in this great celebration parade to the consummation uh, of the wedding vows. 
That's a picture that John is trying to evoke here. The end has not yet come. We're going to see that in chapters 21 and 22. But for now, God looks at his people like a bridegroom would think of his bride. Beautiful, pure, blessed, and holy. And so as he would anticipate the time that he would come and get her to be his forevermore. So the picture here is of God longing to be with his people. Uh, we might not get that unless we get the background properly, but it really, I think, makes a, a great impression upon us when we understand the picture here. It's not just a wedding. It is God eager to get his people home to him. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, uh, we've already just mentioned, Leland mentioned Ephesians 5 and brought that to our mind, so we don't need to go read that passage. But somebody else go to uh, Mark 2 and verse 20 and maybe have that passage ready. Who's got 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2? Could read it. Yes, yeah, Steve? For I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste version of Christ. Paul is using that imagery there as well. It was the father's job to make sure that nothing happened to the bride until the day of the wedding. And Paul said, I betrothed you to Christ. And it's my job to keep you pure. And here you are listening to all these false doctrines and stuff and making my job hard. And so uh, Paul's point is that I, I love you like a father would love his daughter. I'm trying to keep you right and pure and holy, and, and you folks need to listen to me for that reason. Who's got Mark 2 and verse 20? Read that for us. Go ahead, James. The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. So uh, Jesus is there speaking of himself as the bridegroom. Uh, the messianic age is the time when God and his people can finally get together. And of course, we realize, just as we see here in Revelation chapter 19, that we have begun a relationship with our Lord and with God uh, through him, but the, the closeness, the, the ultimate getting together, the union, the marriage, is not going to happen until later. Until that time, we are, as Paul would say, betrothed. We are dedicated and engaged and uh, on that track. And we already mentioned Matthew 25 uh, the imagery there, Jesus says that the coming of the Son of Man at the end of the world will be like when a bride is coming back with her bridegroom and the wedding takes place and you need to be ready for that when it happens. But it is again that same kind of imagery. Now, uh, the predominance of all this imagery in the New Testament, of course, unsurprisingly, goes back to the Old Testament. We hear a lot in the Old Testament about the marriage of God and Israel. Not surprisingly, in Hosea, who had a horrible marriage that reflected God's relationship with the Israel that he had then. And yet, in Hosea 2, God says, the time is going to come when I'm going to have a bride that's not like this one. Pure, chaste, undefiled, and dedicated and so Hosea 2, we, we hear about that. But the imagery appears also in Ezekiel and in the latter chapters of the book of Isaiah. You think about, again, those latter chapters of Isaiah, people coming out of Babylonian captivity, that's kind of like that, the bride coming from her house to the bridegroom's house, that God is going to fetch his people and bring them unto himself. So it shouldn't surprise us that in those latter chapters of Isaiah, we hear that kind of message as well. Uh, and of course, remember that here, the point of it all is the purity of the saints. Uh, we are told here, the bride is ready, and she has clothed herself in fine linen, bright and clean, and John says, in case you don't know, that is the righteous acts of the saints. Not just, of course, you know, good deed doing, helping little old ladies across the street kind of righteous acts, but faithfulness in this persecution. 
standing up and being counted as a Christian even when it meant their life. That is her purity, and God's design has always been to have a people like that, that trusts him, believes in him, dedicated, committed, they will give their lives for him. God says, those are the people that I'm going to bring to me and have them with me forever. All right, then, look in verse 9. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Uh, we've noted that there are several Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. And if I've counted correctly, this is the fourth one. Blessed is he that you know, overcomes those kinds of things. Here's this one. Blessed are those who are invited. Of course, the only people that get invited are the faithful. God's always been that way. You think about Israel in the wilderness. God brought them into the wilderness and he tested their faith. And God said, if you show yourself faithful, then you get to come and be with me in my land. And that generation of Israelites wouldn't be faithful and they didn't get to go in. Uh, same kind of thing here, that to be invited means that you have been approved by God as faithful and those people will be the happiest of all as they uh, join their God forever and ever. We hear this same kind of thing, Luke 14 and verse 15. Jesus was at a, a dinner one time and somebody said, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. There's another element to this that we need to look at. A wedding feast. Um, it's not just a celebration. It's also a time of togetherness. The family comes, sometimes from long, long distances. And it's the time when all the, the children, the sons and the daughters and the aunts and the uncles, they're all together like a big family enjoying this great time in life. So it doesn't really take a lot to, to figure out why a wedding would be an image of the Messianic age, a time when God's family has come together to celebrate the greatest joy that they would know about. And the Jews understood this, as this one fellow said, that isn't it going to be great when we all get together and enjoy a great feast in the kingdom of God? Eating is a very common symbol or metaphor for fellowship in the Bible. Sharing a meal together meant in the ancient world that you accepted one another. And not eating with somebody meant that they were not worthy to be uh, uh, to have fellowship. Uh, Isaiah 25, verses 6, 7, and 8, one of the great messianic prophecies in Isaiah. The, the days are coming when the Lord will establish a lavish banquet on this mountain for all the nations, and he will serve fine uh, aged wine and the choicest meats with the marrow and fine wine, and he will remove the veil that is over the nations and so forth. Uh, but the Messianic age is there described as this great gathering together of God's people from every nation to enjoy the very best that God provides. Uh, we see that same kind of thing uh, as Jesus taught in Luke chapter 22 that the Messianic age, uh, the kingdom, is like a banquet. God gathering people together. Now, uh, interestingly enough, banquets were held at the coronation of a king in ancient times as well. And that's probably what's going on there in Isaiah chapter 25, that God would uh, assert his reign over the nations, he would bring his people to him, and the result would be a great celebration. It would happen, Isaiah says, on this mountain, Zion, the messianic Jerusalem, and God would serve them the best of everything, the time would be the time of consummation. And so you look at the, the imagery that John is using here, and something very interesting is going on, that John has kind of combined two pictures from the Old Testament. Uh, he has combined a coronation banquet with a wedding banquet. Remember verse uh, 6, the Lord our God reigns. It is obvious that he is reigning and in control. He is the king undisputed. And then the very next verse we hear is the, the marriage imagery. And so uh, 
it's almost as if John is saying, whether you want to call it a coronation banquet, wedding banquet, it's going to be the best. The best time, the greatest occasion in life, and blessed is the one who gets invited to it. Uh, then in verse 10, then I fell at his feet to worship him. John is overwhelmed by what this angel has uh, shown him. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, that's kind of an, an interesting little scene in the book. It happens a couple times, and it kind of raises the question of why did John need to mention this? Uh, was this a problem in Asia Minor. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 18, to one of the churches that was not far from the rest of these seven churches of Asia, uh, we hear Paul mention something there in passing about the worship of angels. And so there's just enough hint about it in the New Testament to make us suspect that, that maybe angels were being worshipped. Now remember the Jews believed that God had put angels in control of everything. That's certainly the picture we get in the book of Revelation, that the angels are the ones that blow the trumpets and pour out the bowls of wrath. And so were there some who were calling on angels, praying maybe to the angels to deliver us from our enemy? And John does that here in the vision, and he is told, no, no, that's, that's not what to do. Um, shouldn't surprise us given the background. The pagans did it as well. Some have suggested that it might even be a reference to the uh, emperor cult, that maybe this is a veiled reference to the emperor cult. I don't know how much I believe that or not, but uh, this is an inscription that is uh, in the city of Miletus. It's on the side of the theater there, and at the bottom is a prayer addressed to the archangels. And there are seven of them. You can see these uh, circled uh, areas here. There are six of them. There was a seventh. This part's been broken off. And so this prayer was addressed to the archangels, and the prayer calls upon them to guard the city of Miletus. So there is evidence that people were calling on angels to protect them, and maybe that's what's going on here as well. Uh, and John is therefore correcting this idea and making his readers understand that, no, the angels aren't going to save you. It is God alone who is going to do this. Uh, we're told at the end of the verse that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. True prophecy witnesses to Jesus. He's the one that they need to give their attention to. And so we have here a very concise view of how the Christians understood the Old Testament. All of those prophecies, and John is quoting them and alluding to them one after the other here. His point is that it's all about Jesus, the Messianic age. It's all about what God would do in Christ. And so it's not the angels that need your attention here that you should pray to. It is God. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 11, Peter says that the Spirit of Christ was in the prophets, indicating when the Messiah would suffer and when all these things would take place. And so it is, again, a picture of control, that the angels, they're just messengers in all of this, errand boys. It is Jesus and his Father who are ultimately going to do this, and if you need to pray, pray to them. I think we are out of time for this evening. It's a uh, quarter after, and so we'll pick up and do the latter part of chapter 19 next time, Lord willing. Thanks for your good attention as always.